Okay, so uh, we're on uh, The Great Gatsby Chapter 2. I'm going to go through it step by step. Um, the first description um, that we come across is this, this horrible place. Okay, everything about it is like the opposite to, to where Nick sees The Great Gatsby's mansion. Okay, to West Egg. Okay. So it says it, it's a it's a, um there's a railroad and it and it and it moves and it shrinks away from a desolate area of land. A desolate means natush, okay? So um we have this desolate area of land here, um and uh, it's called the Valley of Ashes. Ashes is ash ashpa, okay? Uh, like from a cigarette. What comes from a cigarette? Like the from from burnt stuff and it's a really amazing description called a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens okay so instead of having nature you have like industry like we've got the the back the the the, the really bad side of all this money that's being made people all these these people with the money have to throw their garbage somewhere so this is the garbage okay we've got chimneys and smoke and and even the description of the people, uh, you know, uh, of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the pow powdery air, moving dimly, kilo the men don't know where they're going. OK, and, and even like the way that the descriptions are quite amazing. It says a line of co uh, car, gray car crawls, crawls. When you think of crawling, you think of bugs, you think of, you know, creatures. You don't think of anything nice. You talk about a giving out a ghastly creak a creak is like when it goes right and it comes to rest and even the men are, are described as ash gray their, their faces are gray the color of ash okay and uh, they swarm up with lead and spade and stir up an impenetrable cloud which screens their obscure operations from sight so they're digging up all this ash and it makes this cloud and then you can't see anything which is also a bit of a metaphor because we really don't know what's going on what are we doing here anyway i mean we've come from this gorgeous area where everything's perfect and now everything is disgusting okay so um but above the gray land and spasms of bleak dust spasms is like he'd cut to yacht okay um uh which drift endlessly you perceive after a moment the eyes of dr tj eckelberg so the weirdest thing about this is you see these big giant eyes what are these eyes okay uh they they look out of no face but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles spectacles are glasses okay it's an old word for glasses which pass over a non-existent nose so there's no nose that you can see you just see these eyes and these spectacles so Basically, this is written in very difficult, uh, difficult English. But what happened was somebody who was an, an optician, uh, oculist is an old word. OK, he came and he set up a business and he made this big, um, like a big advertisement that he put on the side of the road, like a placard, a billboard, they call it. Um, but what's happened, ironically, is everything kind of through because it's not been kept up and it's not been repainted. It just starts to look really weird like as if someone's staring at you and these eyes well we, we can think about what the eyes are a metaphor for in the book but there's this idea of somebody watching okay which is also not very pleasant so um and then you say the valley of ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river and when the door drawbridge is up it lets the barges through okay so you've got this river foul means disgusting like full of uh you know fruit and vegetables that people meat that people throw out it's really gross okay um and uh and then you've got the the there's a drawbridge a drawbridge is a, a a bridge that goes up and down and it lets barges go through barges are boats that uh go on rivers river barge they're narrow boats okay so the pet um and so what can happen is if you're on a train you can stare at this horrible sight for a while and this is very interesting because why are we here? Um, uh, uh, and it because of so when they they wait there in this horrible area, um, this is how he gets to meet Tom Buchanan's mistress, who he heard about in the previous chapter. OK. Uh, everybody knows it, right? Everybody knows he has a mistress. It's public knowledge. It's common knowledge. 
Um, and, and it's not the fact that he has a mistress. It's not the moral issue of him having a mistress. It's the fact that he takes her with him wherever he goes. Um, and, and people don't like it. Why don't they like it? You'll see in a minute why they don't like it. Um, OK, so he, he's gone up with, New, with Tom to New York on the train. And they stop off because the train stops there. And, uh, and he says, and, he immediately, and this is typical of rich people. They don't have any plans. And they just decide things at the last minute because they don't need to plan anything. They don't need to work. They can do whatever the hell they want. So he says, we're getting off. I want you to meet my girl. Um, so uh, and the narrator says, I think he tanked up a good deal at luncheon, meaning he drunk a lot. And his determination to have my company bordered on violence, meaning he was like so obsessed with having Nick with him. He couldn't he couldn't see straight. And Nick felt kind of forced to be in a situation that made him uncomfortable. And that makes us ask, well, who is this narrator? Like, why is he all the time doing things that don't make him feel comfortable? Like, is he a real is he a person who's actually going to end up changing anything around him? And that will come up later on in the book. And he says, like, you know, obviously he's very arrogant. So he just assumes that Nick isn't busy. Nick will come with him. OK, so they go to um, they they go um, under the road and they and they see this when it says under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. They're very close to this billboard with the picture of the eyes. And it's as if the eyes are looking at them wherever they go. OK, so then there's a lot of description here. Very rich description of this awful area. And, and I think this is very good for us because it really helps us understand the deep contrast between these incredibly wealthy people and the incredibly poor people. This was life in New York, that you had people who lived in horrible lives and you had people who lived lives of complete fantasy and luxury. OK, so he goes into a garage, a garage where they fix autos, OK, where they fix cars. And um, eh, nothing really looks good. Like this is just a place, you know, dirty where there are bits of cars around. Um, and uh, what's it? OK. It occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind and that sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead when the proprietor himself appeared in the door of the office, wiping his hand on a piece of waste. So he thinks that maybe his mistress is some kind of a prostitute or something that they've got very nice rooms upstairs for clients and and it's uh the garage is a kind of disguise but this is not the situation at all in fact the situation is much worse okay so we have this this uh mechanic who greets them and he's obviously george's he's obviously tom's mechanic and they greet each other slap each other on the back and uh um and wilson says uh when are you going to sell me my car um and uh, tom says next week um and he complains why why is it so slow why is it taking so long for you to sell me my car and again this tom is quite nasty right he says because uh, wilson says works pretty slow don't he because we're talking about the man who's working on tom's car that he wants to sell to uh wilson and tom says no he doesn't and if you feel that way about it Maybe I'd better sell it somewhere else after all. So he already threatens not to sell it to him. So if so, Wilson explains, you know, quickly covers himself. So I didn't mean that. I just meant, again, you've got this very interesting thing going on. You've got the power, um, people who are powerful, right, and people who are powerless, right. So the person, this is a person, this is their interaction, and the person who's powerless basically. <coughs> Nothing you can do, right? He has lost. Tom has the money. He has all the cards, okay? Um, so uh, then we hear footsteps down the stairs, and the mistress of Tom Buchanan comes in. And I think uh, Nick is surprised, and I think us as readers are surprised because, you know, Daisy's completely gorgeous. You know, everything's perfect. If she's elegant, their house is beautiful. And this mistress is not a beautiful woman at all, right? She was, she's quite fat um, and she's, she's very sensuous. Like she carries her flesh sensuous. She's kind of sexy, but not in a really nice way. Um, uh, and it says her face above the spotted 
cream of um, a spotted spotted dress of dark blue of crepe de chine contained no facet or gleam of beauty, and there was an immediate uh, uh, there was something about her that has energy, but she doesn't look beautiful. So, and this is really awful. She smiled slowly, as if and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom. She literally ignores her husband and looks him straight in the eye. They're literally having an affair under the eyes of her husband. Something, it's so crass, it's so horrible, okay? Um, and uh, she wets her lip and she says in a, vo a voice, get some chairs, why don't you? Like she just bosses him around um, and he goes off and he, uh, and, um, um, and then she moves close to Tom. Like, it's just like such a, it's very out there. Like, there's nothing hidden here. Okay, so Tom says, I want to see you. Get on the next train. So Tom has a little bit of an idea that he can't do everything in public. They won't get on the train together, but they arrange to meet up. Okay, um, so they so they go and wait for her out of sight. Um, and, and now we get to know what time of year it is. It's just before the 4th of July. Remember the Americans, um, they like to, they celebrate the 4th of July and there's an Italian child who's selling, selling something for the 4th of July, some kind of toy torpedo, like a kind of rocket. And Tom says, terrible place, isn't it? Um, and Nick says, awful. And then he says, it does her good to get away as if he's doing like a favor to, to this woman by having an affair with her. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she's goes to her sister in New um in New York. He's so dumb he doesn't know um he doesn't know he's alive. Right. So he or he's so dismissive, like this husband is an idiot, he doesn't know anything. And I think like our feeling and I and also by the way, when we watch the movie, you get the same idea. It's you feel so ew crawly about this whole situation. Yuck. OK, so they go. So they go up to New York and they meet discreetly somewhere else. And she's already changed her dress and she's wearing this tight dress. And and uh, he's buying her things because that's what you do when you're having an affair. You make sure that the woman you're with has everything she needs. Um, and all of a sudden she gets this. Uh, she she gets it into her head that she wants a dog. Um, and she says, I want one of those police dogs. I don't suppose you've got that kind. I mean, what is a police dog? Um, and and he, you know, and the man pulls this little puppy out of the out of the um, basket. And Tom says that's no police dog. And she says, uh, she says, no, I want to get one of those dogs. I want one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. And she just wants it as a decoration. It's very interesting. It's like this uh, very uh, irresponsible attitude to anything else that's living. It reminds us a bit of. Daisy and how she treats her little kid. So, um, um, where are we? So the man says, uh, uh, it's not a police dog. It's more of an Airedale. Um, and, and she says, oh, it's cute. Um, it's probably not a purebred dog. It's probably mongrel. Um, and she asks if it's a boy or a girl. And, uh, and he just gives her money. He just pushes money at her. Here's your money. Go and buy 10 more dogs with it. You know, like whatever you want. So, uh, he, uh, um, so they, they carry on and then Nick decides he's, he, Nick wants to go, but Tom won't let him. Okay. You have to understand that he has power over everybody. He has the power over w uh, Mr. Wilson. He does whatever he wants with him. He's taken his wife literally from under his nose. He has power over this woman. You know, he can buy her, you know, as his lover. Um, it's it's a very um, cynical way of looking, dealing with the world. But that's what happens when people are very, very wealthy. Um, OK. OK, then she uh, says she's going to telephone her sister, Catherine. And uh, she said to be very beautiful people who ought to know. OK. And he's trying to he's trying to get away, but he just can't get away. Um, and they're going. Um, and she says she's going to invite some people called the McKees and she's going to call her sister. And we go into this apartment where he keeps his 
his mistress, okay? And there's, there's a description of this apartment with all these big pictures everywhere and, um, and lots of, uh, copies of magazines. And, uh, it's, this is obviously, you know, a place where he keeps is not particularly nice. Um, and there's a, a, an elevator boy because it works a bit like a hotel. This is like a, an apartment that's being taken care of. And he, and he's sent to get, uh, um, some milk and the biscuits for this little dog. This kind of makes the scene very strange. You've got this little puppy and you've got this, uh, Tom and his mistress and then various people that she wants to invite. Okay. So they get very, very drunk. Okay. There's a lot of alcohol being drunk here. Uh, there could be drugs being done as well. We don't know. Um, and, and obviously because they're a bit drunk, they're calling each other by their first names. And, uh, the sister comes along. So the sister's also involved in this. You know, her sister has a lover, is having an affair with somebody and she, she doesn't seem to mind. This is a place where there really isn't much morality at all. Like it, it's really quite shocking. Um, and, uh, um, and then there's a, Mr. McKee, who joins them, and there's some really great descriptions of all these people who uh, don't look particularly like people you'd like to meet. He's apparently um, um, he's a photographer. His there's a description of his wife. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. Like she's just not also not a great person to be with. Um, and she shows off and says her husband had photographed her 127 times since they'd been married. And Mrs. Wilson has changed her dress again. This is the third time she changed her dress. Um, obviously, because he's buying her all these clothes, so she wears them to show off in front of him. She can't really wear these dresses in front of her husband because then he would ask her where she got them from because there's no money there. Um, and so, and now she's, uh, she's, she's gone changed from being like this, this, uh, vital, vital person, like this person full of life. And now she's showing off was converted to him, impressive hauteur. Like she is Tom's mistress. She's showing everybody, um, you know, who she is. Um, and uh, she wants everybody to look at her. She does everything for attention. Um, and then she talks about how all these men are terrible. Um, most of the men will cheat you every minute. All they think of is money. Um, and uh and then they're like it's all very superficial they're admiring each other's dresses and things like that or uh, even though she talks about people taking money but she's really taking tom's money okay um and uh then mr mckee talks about uh about her modeling for him um all right so then they they drink some more um and uh, then she's sort of, you know, kissing the dog and stuff. Um, and now we have a question about where Nick lives. And he says, uh, he says he lives at West Egg. And guess what? They all have all heard of this man called Gatsby. We haven't met him yet, but everybody knows him. Um, and so here's a rumor about him. He's a nephew or cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm. Kaiser Wilhelm is the emperor of Germany at the time, okay? Um, and uh, that's where all his money comes from, really. So there's lots of rumors about him. Um, and somebody else says, I'm scared of him, all right? I'd hate to have him get anything on me. So obviously Gatsby is somebody quite powerful, okay? Um, and uh, what else? Um he he's looking so mr mckee is looking to get more work on long island as a photographer so he's kind of hinting that uh that that tom should sort of hire him okay and then something else came up which was very interesting he says you see catherine says triumphantly she lowered her voice again it's really his wife that's keeping them apart she's a catholic and they don't believe in divorce um so this is about tom right this is a rumor that she's Catholic and that the Catholic people don't believe in divorce. Um, and so it seems that Catherine thinks that Tom and Myrtle are going to get married. Um, but Daisy's stopping them. OK, because she says when they, they do get married, they're going to live going west for a while until it blows over. Um, 
All right. So then they talk about Monte Carlo and different places where rich people go. Um, and, uh, um, and then there's like really, um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Mrs. McKee says something which is pretty not nice. She says, I almost made a mistake too. I almost married a little kike who'd been after me for years. Kike is a very bad word for a Jew. Okay. It's a negative term. It's like calling a black person a nigger. Okay. So, um, uh, so, so then Myrtle says, well, you didn't marry him. At least you didn't marry him. Um, and Myrtle says, well, I married him. That's the difference between your case and mine. And, and Catherine says, nobody forced you to marry him. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman. Um, I thought he knew something about breeding. So it's kind of like she is a low class person, but she's convinced herself now she's with Tom that she's actually a high class person who fell into a bad situation. Um, and, uh, and, and Catherine, his, her sister reminds her, says, well, you were crazy about him for a while. And Myrtle says, no, it's not true. I was never crazy about him. It's like she's rewritten everything. Like it, she doesn't have any feelings towards her husband. Um, and uh, the only crazy I was was when I married him. I knew right away I made a mistake. He borrowed somebody's best suit to get married in and never even told me about it. OK, so she's saying, you know, bad things about her husband. And Catherine says she really ought to get away from him. They've been living over that garage for 11 years. And Tom's the first sweetie he had. So there's kind of a little bit of expectation that Tom will eventually marry Myrtle. And we're going to find out later on whether that's the truth or not. So now there's another bottle of whiskey. They're getting more and more drunk. They're having something to eat. Um, and then there's some kind of a big argument going on. Um, and and he, this is very interesting. OK, I was too looking up and wondering. I was within and without, simultaneously enchanted and repelled. OK, so he's kind of he's got two different attitudes. He's like inside and outside and he's enchanted. Uksam, but he's repelled the Magiloto um, by the inexhaustible variety of life, by the, the, all the things that are going on. He just can't deal with it. OK. Uh, and uh, Myrtle starts telling telling Nick about when she first met Tom. OK, that they met on it. They met on a train. Um, and uh, and he, he came. He says when he came into the station, he was next to me and his white shirt front pressed against my arm. So I told him I'd have to call a policeman. But I but he knew I lied. So it's kind of like. Tom just takes whatever he wants, basically. OK, so he just pushes himself on Myrtle. And Myrtle sort of gives in to him. Um, OK, then she's uh, again talking about all the different things that she's going to buy. A silk bow from Mother's Grey, cute ashtray, a massage, all these things that he's obviously she's doing with his money. OK. Uh, and then so it was one of these parties. One minute it's nine o'clock. The next minute it's 10 o'clock. Got no idea. Everyone's getting super, super drunk. Nobody knows what anyone else is doing. Um, and uh, and this poor little dog is sort of going blind with all the smoke, which is kind of funny. Um, and then uh, and then something ha this is something very disturbing happens. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. This is who he is. He has not only got power with his money, but he's got power with the strength of his body. And he's going to use it for his own ends. And he's going to use it to make sure that he has he's always the one in control. He breaks her nose there and then. Then there were bloody towels. It's interesting. Nick doesn't actually uh, have any kind of emotional reaction. He doesn't say whether it's good or bad. He just describes the scene. It's all crazy. And there's a wail of pain and there's bloody towels. And then there's um, and his uh, then there's Mr. McKee waking up and people, you know. But like in terms of whether what did, did Tom have to take any consequences for doing something really, really bad? No. OK. Uh, and then so Mr. Key turns to leave. 
like they realize things have now gone downhill. Myrtle got a broken nose. Um, and uh, so Mr. McKee goes out and Nick follows him. Come to lunch Sunday. So this is the thing. He's about to leave the door and he just says, come to lunch Sunday as if nothing has happened. OK, um, where anywhere? OK. Um, <sighs> so then um, the next thing he knows, right, he's in bed with this man. OK, I was standing beside his bed with this Mr. McKee and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear, the great portfolio in his hands. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lever level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the Tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. So this is like a really crazy afternoon. OK, that we meet the lover of Tom Buchanan. They go to um, her, the little apartment that he has for her in New York. They meet her sister, Catherine, and Mr. and Mrs. McKee. Um, and he ends up. Uh, Tom Buchanan ends up breaking his mistress's nose because she complains about Daisy. And Nick ends up in bed with another guy. OK, this is the life of, of these people. 